Fiber Floss and Fiction. Today is November 16th, 2022, and I am back for my two week ish uh, podcast episode. So, if you are a new viewer, welcome. And if you are a returning viewer, as always, welcome back. I'm so pleased that you've decided to spend some time with me today. So, I'm trying a different filming setup. Uh, this is upstairs in our kind of dining area space. The fireplace is behind me. Some of my finished stitchy things. Um, hopefully the volume will be okay. If not, uh, I will upgrade that hopefully with my next video. Um, but I felt like the light was a little bit dim in my office and this gives me more natural light kind of coming this way and hopefully the the video portion of this will be a little bit not clearer but brighter I guess the colors will be a little bit truer um so gonna have our usual kind of discussion where we talk about knitting and yarn crafts and then I'm going to talk about books and then I'm going to talk about some stitching things so I will uh, endeavor to add timestamps down below, uh, and as well, I will try to put the little postcards in between to break up the topics so that you can pick whatever you're interested in. So it's a very nice day here, except it is extremely cold. We actually had our second batch of snow. Uh, what day was that? I guess overnight, Sunday into Monday. Um, which is very early for us. We usually don't get snow here until the end of December, so we're about a month early for for snowfall here, uh, at least for the years we've been here. Now, granted, it's been a drought here in northern New Mexico for pretty much the entire time we've lived here, but uh, it is definitely early, based on my experience here, for the snow. But I love snow, so two thumbs up. Very happy about that. Okay, I have a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead. We're gonna just kind of jump right in and let's get started on the yarn crafts. So I have several finished things to share with you all this, this go round. Um, let's start first with the compass cowl, which I finished up. Um, this was a very quick knit, but a super enjoyable one. I had received four skeins of Marie Wallen's British Breeds four ply, which is a fingering slash sock weight, uh, in a teaster box from the Woolly Thistle last year about this time. So the colors are Raw, which is undyed, Woad, which is that blue and dark blue, uh, Lion Flower, and Evergreen is the dark green. And I had been looking for a project that was going to use most of these 93 yard skeins. They were just like 25 gram skeins. They're developed for color work. So, I mean, it's great that they come in those little small sizes if you're gonna do a multicolored project, which a lot of Marie Wallen's designs are, but with just four of them, it was kind of a struggle to figure out what I was gonna make with them. So. This is, again, the Compass Cowl from Tin Can Knits. It is written for five colors, but I did it in four. And I think, honestly, you could make this with any scraps, like sock yarn scraps you had. I think it would be really cool if, if it was like a fade where you kept one color as the main color and then just change the background color throughout rather than switching them you know, I have some, I have the light color as the motif and some I have the darker color as the motif. Um, but I used up basically all, I think there was either two or three grams left of two of the colors, the white and the woad, or the raw and the woad. And then I used up um, somewhere around 12 grams, is that right? No, 16 grams of the other colors. So I was able to use up most of what I had and I really like how this turned out. I think the color definition is great and it softened up quite a bit after washing. So while it's not like merino soft, 
it is it is very comfortable to wear next to skin. And my husband, who never asks for anything knit, liked this enough that he asked if he could have it. So, of course, I said yes. Um, I, it wasn't a like a project plan for anyone specific. So I was glad that he liked it enough that he would like to wear it himself. So um, highly recommend this. It would be a great uh, starter project if you um, are new to stranded knitting or color work. So uh, I think there's lots of things you could do with this. If you had two half skeins of sock yarn, you could also do this just as a two color cowl and I think it would be equally, equally good. Uh, next up, I have finished my Muscle Bro hat. This is a sock weight yarn version. The pattern comes with multiple options for, I believe it's lace all the way up through bulky. Um, and you can just cast on and then fit, figure out what your gauge is uh, as you are knitting. So um, it's pretty foolproof. You pick the needles you like, um, start here at the top with a pinhole type cast on, then you work the increases and then you work down the body and then you keep knitting and knit and knit and knit and knit some more. And then you do the decreases at the opposite end to match, to match and then fold it in inside out. So I used for mine one skein of McMullen Fiber Co's Posh Sock, which is their um, cashmere silk superwash wool blend base. And this colorway is called Gentle Anne, and it is from their Bronte Hallows Eve box, which had three skeins of yarn, one for each of the Bronte sisters in it. And I love these soft mauves and pinks. I just, yeah. This was definitely like a colorway that spoke to me. Um, it, this is super warm and it is very, very soft. Um, I had, what did I have left over? I had about 20 yards left over, so I could have made this long longer, but I didn't want it to be super slouchy. I think with the 400 and, so these skeins have like 410 yards in them. I think with the skein, the sock yarn skeins that have about 465 yards in them, you could have enough depth here that you can turn the brim up and have a beanie style with four layers because you've got the two, the inside and the outside, and then you have another two folded up. So that would make for a very, very warm hat. Um, the other options that you have is, are you could use two skeins of yarn, like 250 grams, and do the outside in one color and the inside in another, and then you know, make it completely reversible. Uh, I think that would be really fun, especially if you did a multicolor on the outside and a plain color on the inside, and then you could fold the brim up and have that be like a contrast and, and reversible as well. Um, the only thing that is even a little bit difficult about this, and it isn't super difficult, is that starting point. It's just fiddly. Um, I use the Tin Can Knits online tutorial and it wasn't hard to do. It's just one of those that you have to put a very small number of stitches on multiple needles. And so it's, it's fiddly because you have all these sort of ends of the needles sticking out, trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, there's just no getting around it. Um, I guess you could technically do like a provisional cast on and do like knit two versions from the, the, this edge down, but I mean, to me that takes almost as much time. So that's how I did mine was just the, the little starting point there. So um, highly recommend this pattern. Like I said, it works for any yarn weight and it, the fit is great. It's got sizes from, I think in, no, not infant, baby up to adult large. Um, and it'd be a great way to use up like partial skeins. You could make it striped. You could do, I mean, you could really just make it your own. It's kind of a blank, blank canvas. So highly recommend that. Um, the last thing that I have that's kind of a finished object 
not quite, but almost, um, is I have spun one more mini skein in my gradient hand spun that I am spinning from a gradient pack from Hilltop Cloud Fiber. They're based in the UK. And this colorway is called Moon River, and it's a blend of some wools and silk. And I have um, one big skein finished up that's this really, really dark purpley gray. This is three of the colors. And if you watched my last video, you'll know that I decided rather than spinning bigger skeins, because it's very hard to tell that there's actually three subtle shades in this. So I was worried I might reverse which end to start with when I actually get this knit up. I was going to go ahead and do small skeins. So this is the next color. And then this is the one I just finished. You can see it's getting slightly purpler and slightly lighter. And the very last color is a pale mauve. Um, so I have, this is three, four, five. So I have four more gradient steps to spin um, to get this finished up. It's a pretty large batch. It's like 250 grams. So I'm just working through them. This little skein, um, they're all two ply fingering weight skeins. Uh, this is about 187 yards and just under two ounces. So yeah, looks good. Um, so that's sort of a finished thing. It's not quite finished, finished, but it's in progress. And so more to come on that. Um, okay, let's talk works in progress. So I have a few things that I am actively working on. The first of which I will share with you are my vintage fairy lights socks. This pattern is by Helen Stewart and I have knit a pair of these before, uh, but I wore them to death. So I'm replacing them. I have one sock completely done. And yes, this lime, those little pops of lime green do actually show up like that. Um, super bright and very fun with all those speckles, I think. Um, the colorway is Hocus Pocus. It is on Classic Sock by Spun Right Round, which is her 100% superwash merino. Sock yarn weight, I guess that that seems, seems like what it would be. Um, it has this really pretty little uh, sort of um, textured stitch pattern here at the cuff. I'm knitting these on US size ones, uh, two short circulars because that's my preferred method of socks most of the time. And following the pattern as written, it's uh, got a heel flap and gusset and then just a regular wide toe. The one by three pattern that's here on reverse stockinette changes to form just basic one by three ribbing for the rest of the leg. So these have a really nice fit and the ribbing comes down onto the foot of the sock. Here is uh, the yarn label from Spun Right Round. I think, I think on my tablet everything is reversed, but uh, hopefully not. We'll find out. <laughs> We'll find out. And then the colorway is Hocus Pocus. So I have one sock completely done and um, I plan to take this as my car knitting project. Uh, we're gonna be traveling for Thanksgiving to see my family over next week, a week from, basically a week from today um, for Thanksgiving here in the US. And so these will be my car travel project. So I will cast on the second one while we're driving around and getting from here to there. And so that will be my kind of portable car project. I can chat while I work on it. It's an easier project. So that will be going with me. And then I have also got on the needles my, uh, I always wanna call it the morning star and I have no idea why other than that it's sort of, I don't know, it's evening dew. It is this cardigan by Ruriko. And I absolutely love the, the boxy fit and the drop shoulder with the 
kind of narrow sleeves. I have a lot, actually the sweater I have on today, which is a commercial sweater, is very similarly shaped to this, although it's a pullover. Um, this project is worked using one strand of a mohair and one strand of a uh, fingering weight yarn. So I am using this Kid Mo Silk, uh, which is the lace weight, mohair lace weight, from Swoon Fibers in the colorway, I think it's Spring Flowers. I don't have the ball bands with me. And then I am combining it with X Libris's Fibers uh, Silk Merino, Superwash Merino Silk Singles. Um, in the colorway Mrs. Dalloway. So the yarn base is Anais. So here's what they look like together. And this sweater construction is really interesting because it starts out with a provisional cast on um, and you work the back first. So the provisional cast on was up here and I worked that way with it. Um, and then you put the center neck, which is going to be the back neckline stitches on um, scrap yarn, which I've got here. And then you work each side down. So this is the right front and this is the left front. And the shoulder seam is worked in a slightly tighter gauge stockinette with some shaping. So it kind of makes a, an inverted V from the neckline down to the dropped shoulder. So the, sho the sleeves will go in here and it'll be just an open front. And it has this gorgeous like pine cone type. Uh, stitch pattern on it, which is easy to work. Um, you can work it without a cable needle, even though the pattern does call for one. So I have this basically knit down to the bottom of the armholes. And so now I'm at the point that I'm just going to work back and forth, back and forth to work the body. So I've got the stitch pattern pretty well memorized and, um, well, it's not a completely mindless project because when you when you start each of these motifs, you have to you know count across to set them up and make sure there's enough space in between them. So the first row of each of these motifs, you kind of have to pay attention on, and then after that, once you've got them set up, you can work back and forth until you get to the next motif on them. So this is super warm and I absolutely love how it's coming out and that will be kind of my sit in the hotel room or maybe even my plane, plane flight knitting. So that's, that's my plan for that. And then the last thing that I have as a work in progress, and this is a long-term work in progress, I've shown it before, but I've added another full round to it and that is my beach walk blanket. Uh, the pattern, this is a crochet pattern. Um, the pattern is available from Marion Mitchell, I think her last name is. She's Wool Thread Paint on Instagram and Ravelry, but she also has an Etsy store. I will put links to everything down below like I usually do in case you want to find anything. Um, so this is a granny square blanket, which has full size granny squares and mini granny squares, and it is going to be huge. Let me <clears throat> try to get at least most of it. I won't get all of it in there, but um, this is center blocks are done. The small grannies are done and the granny stripe is done. And then I've added this border of dark granny squares and this border of light mini granny squares. So believe it or not, this blanket has another round left to go. It's going to be um, granny squares that are in this color palette as the final round. 
So I'm working on the individual granny squares right now, and I, I can't remember how many of them there are. More than 50, so quite a few. Um, but I'm making progress on this one, and I absolutely love it. It is super warm, very snuggly, um, and I, I just love the colors in it. So, um, yeah, that has been an enjoyable first kind of big crochet project. I did some small individual squares and individual motifs um, just to figure out what the heck I was doing with crochet since I am a relatively new cro crocheter. Um, but then this is kind of the first big project that I've tackled and I really like how it's coming out. Uh, the pattern is super well written. It's got like 19 pages or something. And then Marion also has videos on YouTube for some of the the join as you go type techniques, which have been really helpful. Okay, the last thing I'm going to mention really quick, um, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do like Vlogmas or if I'm just going to do my regular podcasts. If you have a preference as to format, let me know below. One of the reasons I was thinking about doing Vlogmas is because I have uh, coming to me, it's shipped and on its way, the Suburban Stitchers Advent Holiday Box, where you have a bunch of mini skeins that you get to open over the first 25 days of December, as well as a few goodies. So I did her box last year, and I kept up with the, like each day I added to a large shawl uh, Helen Stewart pattern called Dusting of Snow. Um, and I was able to keep up with that. I was actually kind of surprised I was able to keep up with that, but hey, you know, go for it. So this year um, I'm getting the sock yarn version. And I trialed out two separate patterns to see which one I might like to do because um, I want to do another crochet blanket since I've fallen down that rabbit hole. Um, so the two options, these, these by the way, are not colors from uh, the Advent kit. They're, it's just scraps that I had, you know, in stash, sock yarn scraps. Um, this was contender number one that I really thought I was going to go with, but I decided I don't really love these larger holes in a blanket. I just wanted something more solid. I think this is gorgeous and maybe at some point I would make it, but I don't think that's what I want to work on right now. So my other option, this is a uh, free pattern from Pearl Soho. And I think, uh, so what I was going for was something that looked kind of snowflake-ish, that's a word. Um, and so this, this I think still looks snowflakey, but is more solid. And so for this particular pattern, this one you would join all of the squares like butted up next to each other. And this one you have the white around it. Um, and I thought that that would be kind of a nice way to do a unifying color throughout the blanket. I know from having sampled this that I can get at least four of these squares out of 120 gram, yeah, 120 gram sock weight skein. So, and I have oodles of this plain undyed white. So I think this is what I'm going with. And so I am not going to put the pressure on myself that I have to have each day finished. Um, we're also going on a short trip, just my husband and I, no family stuff, um, in December. So I'm not sure that I will necessarily be able to keep up with every single day to get through like four, four or five of these, but I'm going to try. So if it's of interest to kind of see my, <coughs> excuse me, my daily progress on this blanket using those advent box colors let me know and then if that's the majority i will wind up maybe doing a little vlogmas type vlog at least for my knitting things okay so that's it for knitting let's go on and we will talk about books i have three books to talk about this week um two of which i finished one of which i'm currently reading so the first one is The uh, City of Fallen Angels. 
This is the fourth book in the Shadow Hunters series from Cassie Clare. Uh, if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm reading the whole set as a buddy read, buddy read with a friend. We're reading one one a month. So this is November's version, and it is book four. Uh, this one uh, focuses more on the character of Simon, who is the friend of Clary. Um, and I don't want to spoil it if you haven't read the series, but let's just say Simon's life has changed quite a bit since we first met him in book one. And this book is kind of more about him coming to terms with how his life has changed. And uh, it is only peripherally connected with things that Clary and Jace are doing. Um, Simon's really the focus of this book and Clary and Jace are less so, although they are still involved with the plot because the series focuses on them. Um, so won't say too much more about this. Again, young adult fantasy. I really like Cassie Clare's writing and am enjoying this reread. It's been a long time and so there was stuff I had forgotten and my friend was asking me, oh, well, what about this? Is this going to happen? And I was like, I honestly do not remember. It's been so, so many years. So I have finished this one. We'll move on to book five of seven for our December read along. Um, next up is Dead Wake by the author Eric Larson. Um, this is a nonfiction book. It's the first one that I finished for nonfiction November. Um, this is about the last crossing of the Lusitania. So it's set in 1914 and 1915. Uh, the Lusitania, if you don't know, was a large ocean liner. It was a British ship based out of Liverpool, but went back and forth from there to New York. And so it was a passenger ship. This is at the time that Germany was increasing its uh, submarine presence in waters around the coast of the UK, and they had begun sunking, sinking various ships, both, well, certainly like battleships if they could, but also merchant marine ships, anything that potentially was importing things that were going to help the British with their, their end of the war. But uh, they also had sunk some smaller passenger vessels. And so this book, um, it's, it's a very engaging historical nonfiction book. If you think you don't like nonfiction, but you're interested in history, particularly World War I history, this is a great title. The author talks about not only the age of the big ocean liners, and remember this is like the same time within the year the Titanic had, had hit the iceberg and sunk. This is after the Titanic sinking. But it's another one of those massive ocean going vessels that has a thousand plus people on it and is back and forth, you know, from the US to the UK and they have like their monthly runs. Um, so it talks about that. It talks about the development of the submarine as an integral part of particularly Germany's um, arsenal. Um, and then it also goes into a lot of social history about things that were going on at the time. Woodrow Wilson of the, the U.S. president and how he was really not interested in um, engaging in a war on the European theater at all. And then things that were going on in terms of cultural, cultural references and um, the who's who in New York society who were in the first class as well as reasons people were traveling from the United States back to the UK. So a really engaging book um, and very interesting. One thing I did not realize, um, early 20th century history is not my area of expertise at all, was that even though you learn in, in American history classes that the sinking of the Lusitania is the thing that pulled the US into the war, while that's true that the sinking of the Lusitania with the loss of over a thousand passengers, I can't remember the exact number, I think there was 730 out of like 1900 people that lived, that survived. Um, 
the sinking of the boat of the, of the Lusitania did not mean the United States immediately went to war because this was in 1915, the sinking of the Lusitania. Um, it took almost, uh, almost two more years and the sinking of other passenger vessels for the United States to actually join the war. But this was kind of the beginning of Wilson's uh, acceptance of the fact that they that the U.S. was going to get drawn into this conflict. There was really no way to avoid it. You could only shut your borders, but so much. And um, so, yes, this kicked off kind of that slippery slope, um, but I didn't realize that it had taken more sinkings and more time in order for the U.S. to get involved. Very well written, extremely engaging. He, This author has other nonfiction books, if you have interest. Um, I think he also has a new... Well, not new, new, but relatively new fiction book um, that reads kind of as a true crime story. Um, but I really liked his writing style and will definitely read more of his books. Okay, so the book I'm currently reading also for nonfiction November is called The Radium Girls by Kate Moore. So this book is set in it's actually a very similar time period to Dead Wake. It starts during World War I, where several companies were utilizing women, particularly young women, as dial painters for the luminous numbers on watch and clock faces. It was part of the war effort. They were being produced for the soldiers. Um, and so the girls were using a paint that glowed in the dark. Um, we know now, in hindsight, that the, re the reason that this luminosity was there is because the paint had radium in it. Radium, at the beginning of the 20th century, was billed as like the healthiest element ever. It appeared in toothpaste, it appeared in health tonics. Um, people took it in tablet form because it was supposed to be a health, have health benefits. Of course, we now know today that it is a radioactive element and is um, very dangerous. It's not something you would want to ingest. They don't even really, they try to use the minimum amount necessary if they use it for something that's like a medical um, tracking element. So the, girl, the story tr traces a group of women originally in the Orange, New Jersey plant, so near Newark, New Jersey, on the east coast of America, um, who had worked during the war and in the early 20s painting watch faces and clock, clock faces. Um, they didn't necessarily exhibit symptoms of any kind of radiation poisoning uh, immediately, so a lot of this was that it showed up five years later, and they... Several of the women died from kind of mysterious things in their 20s, and they didn't really have a way to test for it. You know, you would test people's blood. Uh, anemia was really the only thing that showed up in blood tests, and so they didn't, they had to develop the technology in order to even test what was going on and why these women were developing strange and very rare cancers. A lot of them developed sarcomas um, and they all had very brittle bones. Um, a, a large majority of them had like gum and dental abscesses where their teeth would fall out and eventually their jaw would disintegrate. Um, so the second part of this book, which I'm into now also follows the group of women who were working at a watch face a watch dial painting company in Illinois, Ottawa, Illinois, in the late 20s and into the 30s, who started experiencing the same kinds of health concerns. Um, so it's an interesting book about uh, occupational medicine as well as like uh, the workforce, women in the workforce, and big companies. Um, the big companies do not come out of this story very, with any kind of good light. Um, you know, before they have the ability to test for radium levels in these women, you can kind of excuse it 
to this point, I mean, we know now that they shouldn't have, that they should have done more, but they didn't really have a way to test for it. They weren't sure what was going on. But by the time that the second set of cases came to light in the late 20s and early 30s, they knew what was going on and didn't want to do anything about it because it would have cost them money. The challenge of big business in any era. Anyway, I'm about three quarters of the way through this one, so we'll report on it. If you are intrigued by this already, let me just say that there's a lot of fairly graphic medical descriptions in here. And if you are somebody who has triggers for either death or medical problems kind of graphically described, this one is not for you because there's quite a bit of that in here. Interesting history though. Um, um, it's one of those books you kind of can't put down once you get started if you enjoy this kind of thing. So the Radium Girls is what I'm working on right now. Uh, we'll be back to talk about that one in a, as a finished book next time, next time we meet. So let's go on now. We're going to talk about stitching. Okay, so I wanted to talk about one small little finished project and then we'll talk about the big finished project. But the small finished project is my December uh, candle mat slash mug rug uh, that is a wool applique project. I have a whole set of, I have a year's worth of kits um, from Shabby Fabrics. The kits come with the pattern and the wool felt and then the embellishments. Uh, they do not include thread, but that's fine. I'm just using um, various threads I have in stash. So I have finally finished this one. Everything is stitched down. The backing is on. It is ready for use in December. It's taken me a while, but I'm actually early. So yay. Um, wanted to share that with you all because it's, yeah, I'm very proud that I got this completed this year. In between... Finishing up my Chatelaine. It is done. It is currently off at the uh, framers up in town to get professionally done with conservation non-glare glass. Say that three times. Um, and so I took a little video that's kind of a flyover so that you all can see what it looks like. And I'm going to insert that video here. Hey, everyone. Uh, I thought I would give you a quick tour of my finished desert mandala piece. It is very hard to keep everything in the frame, so uh, I'm gonna do kind of a flyover so you can see all of the details on it, but it is finished, finally. Several years in the making, but a very fun project and I loved working on it. So let's start here in the uh, center top. This is the um, bear uh, motif, lots of back stitching on that, and then this landscape. It's Monument Valley, I think. Uh, over here is the jackrabbit. This also has this gorgeous um, beaded butterfly. I think it's a painted lady. We do have these um, here in the summer. And then cactus with lots of uh, French knots and other specialty stitches there for the flowers. That was really fun to do. Um, someone asked about the corner. This is the corner that if you've been following this journey with me um, is the one that the uh, like magnifier light that I have when I was stitching in a completely different place actually wound up burning a hole in the fabric under this cocopelli motif and i was devastated mended it and then stitched over it and i actually think it it turned out fine i don't think you can really see it um, there's a few stitches of the mend that maybe are visible but i don't think from a distance anybody will really notice it unless i point it out like i just did uh the Thunderbird motif here. Uh, all of the triangular um, sections like this all have one of these crystal flowers in it. And then another landscape motif. I'm not sure which 
this one is supposed to be. It, it might be uh, the highest peak in Arizona. It kind of looks like that, but I don't, I don't know. I don't think it was designated as anything specific. Then the scorpion. And again, more of the um, specialty stitches for these and this fun beetle. The, um, these two have a ton of beads in them. The beetle is basically all beads and back stitching. And then the scorpion is mostly beads with the legs and the tail uh, done in regular cross stitch. Come on over here to the skull motif. Again, here's that pretty uh, like iridescent flower. And this is Arches National Park. And the Roadrunner and Scrub Jay. This also has lots of specialty stitches for the two flowering plants. Come on over here to the Dream Catcher and Saguaro. The thing about these is that even the ones that don't really look like they have a lot of extra stitching other than the cross stitch, this one actually has a ton of back stitch and little uh, like spikes uh, for the cactus. So it's not super noticeable, but it does provide quite a bit of texture for those. And then finally, the rattlesnake corner with more of the cactus. And this guy also is has quite a bit of bead, beading in him, as well as some black metallic. You can see the beads there, I think. And then we'll come take a look here at this center motif, which is actually what I did first. This one has a lot of these big uh, square beads, as well as some of the bicorns. Tons of metallics. The tree is all in metallic. And then the lightning bolt also has some metallics in it. And as you can also see, the this has oodles of the smaller beads in the border here as well. As well as specialty stitches. Um, so I uh, did... Oops, sorry, I got that in front of my the camera. Um, I did this as a... Um, I just bought the pattern and then I wound up purchasing all of the supplies separately rather than ordering through European Cross Stitch. And I don't think that that particularly saved me much money. Um, the shipping wound up being... A lot for lots of little things because I had trouble sourcing everything at one place so would would highly recommend the European cross stitch option if you want to just kit everything up I, I did use the hand painted silks which were lovely and gorgeous to work with um, in some instances I think they were totally worth it uh, I think for some things like you can see there's a difference in the coloration, very subtle, of these pink flowers. Um, and that's the hand-painted silk. Uh, also, just sections like this blue border right here. You can see it's slightly different than this blue border. Uh, and that's from the hand-painted silks. Scrub J also has two different colors of the hand-painted silk in it. And... You know, it's it's a very fine, subtle gradation. But that said, there's, I think, plenty of gradation in sections like the landscapes, uh, where there's tons of depth of color just because you're using lots of different shades of DMC. So I certainly think that this is a completely doable project with 100% DMC if you wanted to do that. I don't think it would make the design look any less wonderful. Um, so here it is. It is D is for done, as my college professor used to say. Uh, really happy with how this came out. And now that I've taken a, a video of it to share with you guys, 
uh, it's going to go off and get framed hopefully this, this weekend. I'm filming this on Tuesday. What is today? Oh, voting day, Tuesday the 9th of November. Okay, that's it for now. I'm going to return you back to the regular video. So hopefully you enjoyed that tour of my Chatelaine. Um, I, of course, will share it once it's uh, framed in here and completely done so you guys can see it as in, in its final version. But that at least will let you see some of the details and the beading and the different motifs. So hope that you enjoyed that. I am delighted to have it done. So what I am working on now is that I decided I would go ahead and just get some stitching time in on Winter's Encounter, which is going to be my focus piece in 2023. Um, I have it complete to this point. This is, let me back up. This is a mini version of Winter's Encounter. The chart is from Heaven and Earth Designs and the artwork is by Laura Prindle. So this is basically the full size of it, um, height wise. And I am finished all the way over to here and I have, it, it goes to basically this corner right here. So I am just under halfway done, I believe. I'm at, no, I won't even say, I don't know the number. Anyway, I have started, uh, you can see up here in the corner, I have started working on this page and am, Filling in as I go uh, kind of to this halfway point. So I'm going to work on this section here. This part up here gets progressively darker pink, which I am happy about because all these really light white spaces are hard to see. Um, but this is what I am working on. I'm stitching this on 25 count, uh, one over one with the call for DMCs. Uh, I'm really happy with how this is coming out. I I was hesitant to I was hesitant to work on minis, I guess, because I was worried the detail wasn't going to be very good. But at least to this point, I feel like this one is looks great. Um, all the detail in the horse and the snowflakes and just all of it. So I'll be working on this uh, probably through November, so the next time that I talk to you, well, like there'll be more in this, hopefully. And then I'm gonna switch over to a Christmas themed piece, my Long Winter's Nap, which is also full coverage, and I'll work on that in December, just to make some progress on that and have some holiday themed stitching. So speaking of holiday themes, uh, if you've stuck with me here this far to the end of all of this very long video, I have a stitch-based giveaway for my viewers. Um, I have this fun project bag. It's got little rabbits and squirrels. Uh, I think this is super cute and I love the colors. And I'm also going to be sending you um, this Brenda Gervais pattern called Candy Cane Lane. Actually, let me Take it out. Let me take it out so you can see it. I think the glare will be better. Yes. So I will be sending you this uh, brand new pattern from um, Brenda Gervais. From it's actually from 2019, but the pattern is new. And I will include as well, which you don't have to use to stitch it on, but it is big enough to do that if you want. A um, piece of color and cotton. Uh, this is linen, 32 count linen. It's a 13 by 17 inch piece in kind of a classic Christmas red. And there will be a couple other little goodies also thrown in there as well. Um, so if you are interested in participating in that giveaway and would like to have your name put into the drawing, um, you must be 18 or older. It would be great if you were a subscriber here. So if you aren't, just click that subscriber button and you can be included in that list. Um, please do not mention giveaway or anything like that in your comment, but what I would like to know is if you have a favorite holiday tradition, it doesn't have to be Christmas, uh, it can be from Thanksgiving, it can be Halloween even if you would like, um, or any of the major holidays that are celebrated in October, November, or December. Your choice. So that's all I need is a comment just letting me know um, what your favorite 
holiday tradition is for the this last quarter of of the year and i'm going to leave this open to um make sure people can watch the video i know it's going to be a busy couple of weeks for a lot of us here in the u.s with family things and the holiday um so the giveaway will stay open through midnight mountain time on november 30th so if you're interested please leave a comment below and let me know that um, and then I will ship anywhere in the world. So oh, um, international folks, please feel free to enter if you'd like. Uh, I can't promise that it's going to get to you by Christmas if you are outside the U.S. because shipping right now is uh, slightly problematic. But I will do my best to get it in the mail and out to you like as soon after December 1st as I can so that it's on its way to the winner wherever you may be. Okay. So that was a long video. If you've gotten this far, thank you for sticking with me. If you're here in the U.S., have a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday. Um, if you are elsewhere in the world, I hope the end of November is treating you well. Um, let me know your thoughts on vlog versus regular podcast, and we'll go with that. Uh, so I will be back closer to that first week in December. Um, and we'll go from there. So hope everybody is doing well. Take care, y'all. Talk to you later.